we go. So, <laughs> is today we want to talk to you about some ideas on probably new ways of consulting. You'll all shoot me down immediately on that statement. Um, but ways of consulting that are becoming much more emergent as the, the ways that our clients and, and the world in general is working and changing. So, um, see if this will rise or not. Okay. Um, Zoom is stamping all over the top. Yeah, so, we're Teal Unicorn. Um, it is a, a brand made out of fad words, but we like the fads because they're a source of energy to move things along. So, um, Teal, some of you will know, is a buzzword for the highest level of cultural evolution that has yet been achieved by humans. And unicorn is a word for, um, particularly in the DevOps world, but it's a word for organizations that exist but are um, doing stuff that's indistinguishable from magic. So, so you've got the aspiration for highest culture and the aspiration for highest execution in two buzzwords in one brand up, right? Um, so our aspiration is make work better, better results, better lives, better society. So uh, that's what we do. And uh, we work in mostly New Zealand and Vietnam, Vietnam for obvious reasons, Dr. Vu here. Uh, and uh, I've been consulting in Wellington for 15 years now. We will say that we work in New Zealand and Zoom. New Zealand and Zoom. <laughs> we used to commute to Vietnam every couple of months and that came to a screaming halt. So we've had to pivot our business quite rapidly to the online one. So we train and coach globally. Uh, so, um, why new ways of consulting? So. This is the obvious thing. So this is Cherry was one of the last people back into New Zealand. On yeah. And and uh, and the obvious thing that we're watching the empire crumble. Um, and the obvious thing that you've got parts of the world in flames. So there's all these very pressing uh, things all over the media, but there's much deeper things that are happening. There's um, the shifts in social values that are changing out of the expectations in work. And there are the crazy accelerating rate of change, not just of technology, but of everything else in the way we think. These are the two really deep underpinning drivers that are changing how we think about work. Right? So it's pretty obvious that what got you here won't get you there. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and this is an important point to make to our our clients that it's not necessarily that you're doing it wrong because you're a functioning organization, look, we're successful, you're in business, but um, most of our clients are already struggling, aren't they, with their conventional ways of working and finding that that's just not keeping up. So we can really have a conversation around, we're not saying you're doing it wrong, we're just saying that what worked before is not necessarily going to keep working um, with those two big drivers happening around the planet. So with that in mind, um, we, we would summarize the whole presentation or the whole story we're telling our clients for you in a single pitch, which is to survive and thrive in the VUCA world, we use that with VUCA a lot, with, with shifting values and constant change, uh, we need new ways of thinking, which lead, there are new ways of thinking, which lead to new ways of working. And our thing at Teal Unicorn is that that requires new ways of managing. And so our focus as a consultancy is really on unlocking management as the key to new ways of working. I'm going to give this another go. Here we go. So we were originally influenced a lot by some of these books like Reinventing Organizations, Lalu, which is where that Teal word came from. The Age of Agile from Steve Denning, which was a, a pretty good book. Um, he's a Forbes journalist and uh, several military books. So military thinking, but turn the ship around. Um, someone told me how to pronounce, I'm pretty sure it's Mark Hattie, but I 
I immediately forgot what the correct pronunciation was. I don't know okay. um, really good book about submarine captain, also Team of Teams by Stan McChrystal. Military tend to have very focused thinking about mental. Uh, but since then, there's two more books that have come out. One is Brave New Work by Aaron Dignan, which is my new fave book for introducing people to these first induction into these new ways of thinking about new ways of working. Wonderful, wonderful book. And the other one is Humanocracy by Gary Hamill, which um, I can't recommend enough either. Very focused on the human part of this. Um, and I think that um, the basic thesis is that bureaucracy is the poison and humanocracy is the positive opposite of bureaucracy. And then we wrote a book as well, The Agile Manager, which is available on good Amazons. Um, Agile with a small A, small A Agile Manager. We will share these slides with you. Uh, and so we all, we all come up against the reaction from, from within organisations when we start talking about these kind of things, and especially from management. So that's our thing, is trying to unlock the management systems. So we've been, uh, so we first respond by saying, none of this is hypothetical, that you've got the unicorn organisations all playing with the place, but you've got a whole lot of other organisations that are not at all unicorn they're quite horsey, right? So the opposite of a unicorn is a horse. And um, and so it's a pretty down-to-earth basic new core steel, right? These are all people in leather clothes and steel caps and hard hats and experimenting with these, these new ways of working at Senko Cement and Michelin tires uh, are all really interesting case studies in, in, in trying these new ways of working. Not necessarily succeeding, right? Because we're all perfect, human, we're all imperfect, but everybody's well, lots of people looking at this. And for me, the interesting thing was when the really hardcore conservative capitalist media was suddenly full of this stuff. Right? When, when HBR and um, Forbes and Sloan Management Review uh, are, are singing the song, you know it's, it's gone mainstream, right? When BlackRock Investing says that ESG is their focus, when blah, 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 this stuff, when Rio Tinto just get fried, when Exxon have a shareholder rebellion, when, you know, this stuff is, is rolling, this is the momentum. Is, is so we're not, we don't, we're not really interested in debating. If someone's doing, oh, no, 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 we just walk away because, you know, we go to where there's reception to these ideas. So we're in a world of um, new values that are impacting how we work, and, and work is political. That's a big shift, is that work is political. We're no longer expected to hang our persona up at the door and be this neutral corporate drone during the day. People are, especially the younger generations, are expected to bring their whole self to work, to have that wholeness and integrity of themselves at work and to not have to leave their politics on the doorstep. So these things are becoming part of the workplace. Um, VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, um, and agility. You know, business agility is the thing. We're part of the Business Agility Institute. Cherry started the BAI in Vietnam. I kicked it off here in Welly. Um, so, um, you know, this stuff's very mainstream. And then the, the, the things that are happening to us in the, um, around the planet and the, the, the knowledge as consultants and, and for our clients, just trying to keep up with the deluge of books and information and media is just incredible. And, and the pace at which it's changing. Do you know there's 187 different vaccines for COVID? Not five, there's 187 vaccines. The world developed 187 vaccines within a little over 12 months. Is that including bridge? <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 um, the pace at which we can do science and medicine now is unprecedented. That just historically, to be able to do that in that period of time is unthinkable. And, and so the rate at which this knowledge is being created is just staggering and, and, and it's as exponential as the technology. 
So our environment, our environment is that we're all working with these new expectations for clients and partners to, to live these values and to exhibit them as, as our organizations. This crazy change, living in a world of imperfect information, letting go of the idea of perfection. Um, and a flood of competition. So, especially online, the, the number of people around the planet who have lost their jobs or, or, or you know, lost their consulting work and they've decided, let's go online, let's provide free training, let's provide consulting. Suddenly there's this deluge of, of sort of, um, you know, wannabes everywhere. Uh, but we're really striking it online. Lots of noise and trying to stay current. So, so in that environment, we met each other nearly five years ago now, and Cherry was finishing her PhD and was heading out to get a government job as a policy analyst. And I was like, no! <laughs> <laughs> he saved my life. <laughs> so I said, come and work with me, right? And, and, and um, I was called Two Hills. Um, Kokorua Bay is two girls used to live up there. So we rebranded as a team to be Till Yuba. And Cherry was my intern for a couple of years. And, and then I said to her, you'll make more than I do. She was like, I'm silly. And now Cherry makes more than I do. And, and we go back and forth between Vietnam and New Zealand. And when we're in New Zealand, Contrary to everything Cherry will tell you, I'm the boss. And when we're in Vietnam, Cherry's the boss. Or actually, the reality is that in both countries, guess who's the boss? But um, I, I do most of the work in Wellington, and Cherry does all the work in Vietnam because I don't speak a word of Vietnamese, and I just make a projected work. But uh, in both countries, we get re engaged multiple times, which is, is my primary test of, I won't read you this out, it's one of my favorite references for the client, but the key reference for us is, is that we get asked back. And, and it just happens all the time. I should, uh, just a very quick backstory. I got sick and I couldn't go to Vietnam. And um, so Cherry went without me. And we, we have a game, that we, a simulation game that we play where people have to create a message on the wall out of poster cards. And it's the thing about self-organization. It's been a whole day creating this message. And when they heard that I wasn't coming, so I'm at home, um, really sick, and Cherry rings me at the end of the day and says, I'm piping you in to just say something. So I said hello to everyone. And she said, have a look at the message that they created on the wall. So when they heard that I was cross and that I wasn't coming, they created We Love Wrong. It's, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> something in my eye when, when I'm trying to talk to them over Zoom. As, so they all know me, right? They're all our tribe. They're all our people. Uh, so that's us. We work with all sorts of agencies around the organisations around the place, here in Welly, uh, a few in Australia, and a whole lot in Vietnam, some of which you never heard of, because they're tiny, dream tea, own um, three tea shops, right? And Saigon, I always forget how many Saigon they all blue together to me. And, and so there's some really little ones, but there's some pretty big ones too, like Jenna Decker, big logistics of Vietnam, container ports, and distribution warehouses. Garco 10 is garment company number 10. It's a communist regime. Right? And so um, I'm not sure about the shirt, but the trousers are Garco 10. A lot of my clothes are Garco 10 clothes. Um, uh, and, and of course, Vietnam Bank are now a huge client of ours. Vietnam Cherries training vast numbers of their management. They have only 24,000 people. It's the second biggest bank in Vietnam. And I've worked with the C level. And most of them is like all the C level. And it's pretty good. So far, so good. 
Can you hear Cherry okay out there in virtual land? Someone flag us. I think you will. Yeah. So, when we say new ways of working, some people think, oh, yeah, that means remote working. The term has kind of been adopted for remote working. So, yeah, we do remote working. That was easy. This is Cherry coaching a whole bunch of managers in Vietnam. And um, we're in Collingwood, right next to the ocean, in our caravan called Mr. Teal. And uh, we spent five weeks on the road working seamlessly or virtually. So, but that's not what we mean when we say new ways of working. When we say new ways of working, we're talking about a much broader thing around what we call human systems adaptability, all the aspects of humanity at work, systems thinking, and, and dealing with complexity. And so one of our big clients is Garco 10, which until Vietnam Bank was the biggest. So Garco 10, they got a lot of staff too. Are we with factories? Uh, they have 18 factories and uh, 12,000 people. And so you've got the company flag, the party flag, and the national flag, you've got Uncle Ho, present, you know, in the training room, um, and Cherry working away. Quite a nice training room, um, I must say. That's, that's where you want to be delivering training and sort of thing like that. Not bad, eh? <laughs> Only the picture, that one, is cost a million dollars. It's a beautiful uh, lacquer with like a painting of tanks and fighter jets and things. <laughs> oh, I think it's probably called We Whipped Their Ass. So um, what do we mean when we say new ways of work? So for us, we're talking about things, these are things that we've done. These are things that we've done with clients work. Empowering managers with discretionary budgets and distributing authority, moving from big bang to incremental opening of new services. They want to open a hotel by just opening it, having public time. It's like, oh, you know, maybe you want to work your way up to that. So, um, move to standing cross functional teams, move to dynamic self assembling teams, let staff run the whole hands meeting, removal of all roles and working to skills. Staff deciding their own pay levels, uh, stopping all annual planning, the organization, paying people to leave, <laughs> and coaching them to say no to work. So that's what we mean when we say new ways of work. We're talking about these whole new ways of thinking about how we do business. And there's some, you can go over here and read some case studies from some of our clients. They're all better than these case studies at this point. So this leads to new ways of consulting. Uh, we're thinking about new ways of working. It means we as consultants have to work. So I won't go through all of this, but we're shifting from these kinds of behaviors to these kinds of behaviors as consultants in the work we do. So in the interest of time, someone want to call one out? Any there that are particularly open? The last one is particularly interesting. From customer to community. Yeah, because for a lot of organizations in New Zealand, even beginning to think customer centric is a big step forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're all pushing the level, you're highlighting the idea of the community that ties into the whole license to operate, which is part of where we are now in the new society. So, so, so there's one of the things we always have to talk that's a really good. Um, segue, thank you. Is one of the things we always have to talk about is that is is that these are idealized models, right? These are the aspirational, we call them the Matariki, the navigational star, because pole star and North Star doesn't really work in New Zealand, right? So the, the navigational stars that we one day aspire to, to all these behaviors. And and so um, Yeah, this is where we want to get to, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do all it. This is kind of, to be all of this would be to be a unicorn, and it takes a while to learn to fly and be able to pick rainbows, right? So it's, it, it, this, this is the direction, not necessarily what we're going to ask you to do overnight. However, when I've got, let's get on to some 
examples. Uh, and someone used the phrase midwife instead of agent, which I really like. <laughs> Consultants are midwives to, a, to, a, yeah. to ways of working. Better. And so that means that the ways that we engage is shifting. So we, we, we are very louder. So I thought I was really loud. <laughs> um, it might be voiceless at the end. <laughs> it's because I keep looking at the slides. Hang on, let me try and get this. Be um, so yes, we 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 are very much a, a, a new ways in terms of our presentation and our relationship in front of clients. So this photo was taken during a training course. Of me holding Dr. Boo tight, you know, we we get very emotional, we get very empathetic, um, very engaged, and projecting our own personal lives like this. So there's a lot of side effect after my training or coaching. I will tell you the story later. Yeah. So we'll tell us what. So here's a great example where this. I'll give you my nutshell, and then Sherry can expand on it. But come I, the lady in yellow, was behaved as a shouty boss because that's what she thought bosses did, right? And, and, and so she was very much a, a shouty boss, but she's the sweetest, loveliest lady. And so the, the transformation at Minpos was entirely, I reckon, was entirely, almost entirely about just getting come line of behavior. Yes. Uh, that, right? uh, so she took um, my training course on agile management and agile enterprise. So I run it for six weeks, although it is once per week. And then over the six week, so she came with a lot of complaining about how bad her staff uh, is. I said, no, well, it's my, if only one person or two, then I understand maybe because of them. But if most of them are just like that, maybe it's because of you. <laughs> so <laughs> think about it. <laughs> just think about it. And then she said, so what should I do? I said, so tell me how your day goes. He said, I wake up very early and I make the detailed planning for all of my staff. And then every day I, I tell them how to do, what to do, and all that stuff. And so they just sit idle if I don't tell them what to do and how to do. I said, you yeah, know, now you know the consequence of your behavior. So stop telling them what to do and how to do. Just tell them what the reason you want to. Yeah, and for now, don't tell them because they go for you for a long time. They know how to do the work. Just tell them what you want, the reason. And then she just shut her mouth and she just only two weeks and she come up with, um, she said that I have nothing to do now. It wants to work very well. They, I realized that they even far better than me. They take it picture, for example, they, so they, they produce and sell fashion. So Tom Lai believe that she knows how to take a picture, how to post it on media and how to make it nice. So she just do it all the time, but now she stopped doing it and asked the staff to do everything. And then the result is even better than what she got <laughs> by, by herself. So learning from the results after the training, she said, I have nothing to do with my own business. So I think that I need to invest into another business. So now she invested in one kindergarten and run that business and leave this behind because she have nothing to do. It's so fun. It's just in two months. And, this, and so this was where they started working with Cherry. And this is the trend for the business since. So in the middle of COVID, you know, this is 2020 through here. In the mm -hmm. middle of COVID, they were having record months that they've never had yeah. before in the organization. I just want to make sure no one's oops. Just want to make sure no one's waiting in the waiting room. 
Yeah, so uh, I should give you the updated one. So they have the best uh, in in nine years. They got the um, big venues. That was this one, wasn't it? October twenty. No, no, no. It is now. Just oh. this this month. So they got the highest highest re uh, revenues ever in five years. Now uh, in nine years, and this very heavy COVID house at the moment in Vietnam, but they still get that, you know. So let me tell you a bit more about the way we work. So um, the first thing we do is, is we prime the system. So we uh, introduce a few new ideas. Cherry does her training courses. Uh, we introduce them to different ways of managing. Uh, and then we have this idea of an improvement machine, putting together a mechanism to drive continual improvement within the organization and an experiment program, encouraging people to just try it, try little experiments in various different ways. And then we get into hack the org, you know, into ways to get these ideas to spread and fail their way into the organization. Cherry's lucky that. Um, you have such cred that Cherry's usually working with the CA and having a lot of influence directly with the CA, whereas I usually don't have that privilege. So quite often I have to be more you know, of a hacker within somewhere deep in the organization rather than having that direct transformation of capability. Yeah, but with, with the very big organization, I have to uh, tell them that we just have to hack the system because we don't, they can't change it fast. Like for example, with the built-in bike. So first of all, at the, at the beginning, I already worked with the head of transactions office and then head of the branch. You know, the branch is, they have a several um, head office, uh, several head office. Oh, like a it's a division. And then it goes expanding, and now I be able to work with the headquarter. So it's it's growing up from the bottom, not top down in that case, because I have to prove the result to the CE because they they they're the bank. They're afraid of risk. Has she met with you yet? We're slowly working our oh, way yeah, towards getting did, the CE to meet. Yeah. Yeah. What we don't do is. Um, Boil plate solutions and white ring binders, right? I, you know, I have a hammer, where is your nail? Um, which, you know, I had, I had close experience of with one of my clients here, with one of the big four coming in and getting turned straight back around again. The old bait and switch. So the bait and switch is where the show pony comes in and does all the presentations and closes the deal and then says, oh, no, I hand over to my colleagues to run the engagement. And then all the kits and suits come in with the boilerplate solutions and white ring binders. Um, commitments to long projects. So we work monthly, we renew month by month. We're not delivering value, but that's we put the, the skin in the game. Um, we don't body shop, so it's just us. Uh, occasionally we bring experts in to help us. We took our good friend James McMee up to um, Vietnam with us because he was the lean guy and we were working for Gallon Company number 10. And we we're like, oh my God, we don't know anything about factories. And then we got up there and the staff were like, um, uh, so what do you know about garment industry? Nothing. Probably. What do you know about manufacturing? Nothing. <laughs> well, what do you know about, um, you know, and we we're like, nothing. Well, what are you here for? You know, and trying to explain to them that we're here to get the answers out of you. Right? The solutions lie with it. We, we do not presume to come in here and say we know how Garment Company 10 works or even how a Garment Factory works. The people who work here know how a Garment Factory works. And so we applied lean thinking and we did value stream mapping and all those sort of things. And that was great. And we showed them stuff and led them to see the system. But the solutions came out of the people. It was the people who knew they knew what they wanted, they knew what they needed, and it was just facilitating that as the process. So we got fantastic results of Garment Company number 10, but we to this day I still don't know how. Oh, well, no, actually, 
we learned quite a bit about how to make clothes in the process, but that wasn't the expertise we were bringing. Whereas they spent millions of dollars with a large consulting company that might start with a D and um, <laughs> that left them with the weirdest ideas of what lean is and, and achieved absolutely nothing. And in fact, that helped out. We, we say that those organizations generate our opportunities for us because people have tried the big ones and, and realized that that doesn't work. They're all not in. Yeah. Um, and we don't do contracting, it's always by the hour. And we don't do rewards. So I was, I was um, only half jokingly thinking that I'd like to organize a protest to Lampton Key with blackouts and just march up and down my lunchtime going, no more rewards. <laughs> <No more." laughs> right. And just see how many people come out of all the office buildings and join us. And we're always filling up this one. And no projects, sorry. Um, because I talked to from project management, Jerry, yeah, yeah. So um, let me tell you about another case study. This is um, La Marie. And so it's these two uh, lovely ladies who together run a lingerie business. And Jerry, tell us a little bit about this one. Yeah, they're very young, which is my children's age. Say so only 20 something. And they came straight from the university and organized one uh, uh, non-sorite that Rob really liked it. <laughs> and what happened is that they, because they, the startup, so, so they have run about two years and it's very low, quite low productivity. And uh, I, they just came and joined my training. And after the training, they, I, I almost do almost nothing to get them. They were just give them the idea about uh, stop paying uh, commission per, per head, uh, individual, just get the group, make a big cake, and then slide it, divide it into pieces, give it to them. So we, together as a team, to work harder and better, provide better results, and we share among us. So they change the way they pay the salaries and all that. And it changed a lot. And set up meetings, they meet every day. Also, yeah, every team just stay organized. Stop telling people what to do and let people who do the work design the work. It's just basic new ways of working principles. Uh, the flip the hierarchy, the managers, there's no manager, the boss. There's a two girls now has become the servant leader who just provide the condition for people to work. And here's the result. So they do, do all the right thing. And because they, they're quite light and very fresh and you know, very fresh and they didn't have much old school thinking. So they get the ideas very quickly and they provide the results very good. In, I think it's about six months, these are results in. Yeah, so, this is months. the annual for 2019, and this is the annual for 2020 yeah. in terms of product income, revenue, and profit, normalized to 100%. Mm -hmm. Increase the following year. And this is um, probably our favorite client is Hung at Bindook Real Estate. So, Hung's now a close personal friend and one of our earliest sort of engagements, wasn't it? Yeah. So I don't have graphs. You have it, right? So I've got lots of pictures. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So these are the results. Uh, so this lady who's always dream of having a, an organization which where the people are happy to work. It's not only just getting money. But in real, in the culture of the real estate in general, it's very competitive, and people are hiding and information. They don't cooperate. They just work because the pay is individual, and and everyone work on their own, and the revenue is very bad. The expense very high. The cost very high, and. Uh, all that. So she got the old ideas. She followed me since I came back to Vietnam. 
um, kind of you know, everyday coaching. <laughs> I really do everyday coaching to her. And she now become uh, the one the one and only companies in Vietnam which pay people by people decide how much they want to get. I mean in, in, in terms of they make together uh, the prof the profit, they, they make the profit and they share among together and they divide based on the skills and contribution, skills and contributions of each, and they already upgraded that. And so the performance is just, just incredible. This one is the best case that I had. So this is, this is really interesting though. Look at the, the staff levels. So Hung got pregnant and had a baby and was getting all, you know, and carrying his company at the same time. And when they changed the pay system, all the sort of prima donna sales, not prima donna, but all the salespeople who live for the big endorphin hit, all the salespeople who want that massive inrush of money when they close the deal, they were left. They were like, I don't want a steady income. You know, I, I, want, I want the big payola. And yeah. so the staff actually fell. Yeah, it fell from 45 to 9. And the the operational cost is reduced hugely. Look at that, it's 70% reduced. Also, the same avenues for nine people. <laughs> it's still like, you know, the, the revenue is just steady. The revenue is pretty steady, but at, at a yeah, much they, tinier number of people are operating for yeah. so the profit just, and the average, the average payola to each person. So, yeah. you know, why should we share? Well, I'll tell you what, but the average, the average, for each individual employee, I mean, so that the ones who are there are loving. And it's it's not only that. When at the moment they have only four people because of COVID, because people leave for uh, they open another company, so they all the good stuff just gone. And she have to she have herself, her brother, and two others just newcomers, and. Normally, she said, normally I, I spend six months to train a new newbie to be able to sell one pro property. But recently they have they, they spent only two weeks. In two weeks' time, people be able to sell it. And the four people have the same revenues to 45 people. It just blows your mind and nobody believes it. And this is stand up and give the people the idea. I said, why we do that? How we can do that? And it's just. You get a lot of, so, you know, in Vietnam, people are, are cheap. And so you do get a lot of dead wood in an organization. And Hung was, was too sweet. So she would employ people. And, and the, because it was almost a total commission based hmm. system, if you sold nothing, you got paid nothing. So, she thought it's not costing me anything to have these people around. So she wouldn't lay people off. And, and so there were a lot of people there who were selling stuff. And, and I said, Cherry, well, why do they come to work? Well, because they want to say they've got a job. <laughs> you know, it's about that. They just want to say they've got a job. So there were a lot of people who were, I mean, it's a special case. So there were a lot of people who were really good. Uh, but giving her the yeah, but, courage to but, actually. But the change here is the way the policy, the system, and also the way you manage people. It's really changed a lot. It's not about people and even the way you train them. It's a totally different. A totally different way of selling, right? As Jerry said, that the salespeople would hoard information because they were competing with each other effectively. And, and because the commission was to the individual. So they wouldn't tell anyone about property in case they sold it. So they record information. So with the with this way of working, they're totally collaborative. They swarm to an opportunity. They dynamically team around various properties to sell. So it's it's been a weird and huge transformation to that organization. So I did write down our secret formula. <laughs> it, it's so secret that it's on the internet. And and um it's, it's there, you can go to tillyoutman.com, our secret formula. <laughs> and, uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through to it today. But 
the, basically the patterns we've been talking about today, and Dr. Terry's are uh, uh, there on our website. Can we, we finish up by saying that um, you don't, can someone just make a reasonable amount of money? You all look pretty well dressed to me. But, um, <laughs> but you know, there are much easier ways to make money. And, and the reason we do this, and I hope the reason you do this, is because we have an outrageous amount of fun. somehow predict how much we're going to spend over the next 12 months should actually be on stage because they're clearly psychics, right? This, so there are organisations moving away from annual budgeting to rolling budgeting or, or um, you know, all sorts of other mechanisms to, to fund the organisation. There's the, the idea that, um, or just generally, the inability to foresee 12 months ahead is, is increasingly the case in organisations. So, you know, a, a lot of these clients used to make these detailed 12 month plans. So it's like, what for? Just you know, not, not even 12 months. In Vietnam, the Communist Party, they have a five years planning. So, so they often have a five years planning first time, five year planning second time, and we haven't achieved what we want. So, third time. We'll go around again. And I, I was talking to an enterprise architect recently in one of the government departments, and he said, I have a 15 year technology plan. And I actually, I couldn't, sorry, I couldn't help laughing. I should, it's like, what? And it's like, dude. So, um, yeah, we have managed to convince organizations that it's just not a productive use of time. So, so I love the quote that the Ford. Corporation worked. What was? Does anyone remember the number? One point six billion dollars a year they spent on budgeting. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah, we're just quarterly planning. What, what we talk again? Not really time, but if you go to our website, there's a whole bunch of stuff about it that, that you, you plan as far as you can see, and that varies. We have different thicknesses of fold depending on and, and different speed which we're moving to. Um, but for us, we can only see a couple of months. We plan two or three months. And then way out, you have vision of where you want, not actually who you want to be. And in between, what you have is scenario planning, which you're all familiar with, right? That all you can do is map scenarios, consequences, and options to respond to those consequences. And so Mr. Teal, the caravan, is an option. So depending on whether the scenarios, we get so rich that we don't have to work anymore, we've got a caravan. <laughs> if, if we go to bust and have to sell the house, we've got a caravan. If we just need to get out for a while, we've, he's an option in response to a whole lot of various scenarios. But, so scenario, consequence, uh, consequence option in between. And just, we don't waste time planning what we're going to be doing next year or even the rest of this year my, my one of my clients who's the um, ceo of the number five the biggest logistic companies in Vienna. so he said cherry you just you just kill me because i learned i'm graduated from planning economic planning or whatever it is a background and the whole my entire life just Planning, you know, planning in details. Now you say that you just spend time and effort to plan enough to pick something off. Because right after you pick something off, you have to change your plan. So why you have to spend so much money? He said, that's really kill me. <laughs> because of what the heck I've done for my entire life. <laughs> Obviously that's overly simplistic, right? And so, 
like um, Jim and Dick are building a container pool, right? So you don't just plan for the next two months and things to do. So with fungible, uh, with non-fungible physical objects that we only get built once, then you, you, you can't get away from planning uh, for sure. So we're still going to have projects, we're still going to have planning, but it's understanding where we have to do that and where we don't have to do that. And it's also understanding that even though we have to do that, it's punching way out into that book of fog. So, and, and this is something I haven't learned much about yet, but I want to, is that there is a whole, and some of you project management people will, will help you with this, is that there is a whole movement towards much more agile ways of doing project management, right? And even with structures and, and physical construction, that there are ways of being much more iterative and, and lighter or, or more, more agile in our, in our planning. Yeah, I think you're right about the um, the, the detailed planning and mm -hmm. short term and having an idea of where you're going um, the rest of the way. I mean, you do you hit your milestones and you revise your next bits, and it's one of the things that I think is, is quite important from the examples you've given um, of really practical examples um, that can be applied in lots of places. Yeah, and getting people to let go so. Uh, learning to live with VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, we say complicatedness and, um, and ambiguity of information and trying to get away from, you know, we can't move because we don't have perfect information. Uh, uh, we have to plan for the next three years. There was a, one of the government departments, we were doing DevOps transformation and they got an organizational change manager. He said, right. So first of all, what's the target state in two years' time? <laughs> I was like, well, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I said, they're 400 IT people. You tell me how they're going to be working in two years' time. I would have a clue. And he could not deal with it. So in the end, we negotiated a window where I said, they'll probably be somewhere in here, somewhere within 18 to 30 months' time, you know? And he really just... No, no, you've got to give me the target state. So, observations on that is I, I would come back to Patton who says planning is vital. I think the fallacy of all this is believing that the plans are true. That's mm. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's, it's leading, it's understanding. So, another way of putting that is that yeah, planning is essential, but all plans are expendable. Yeah. And, and so, therefore, don't over invest in the yeah. plan. Yeah. If you accept that you're going to throw it away in a week or a month or a quarter, and only put as much energy in as you'll be happy to throw it away. Because people spend so much money on the plan that, that we can't change it now because we're just, yeah, it's this beautifully crafted thing. Look at it. Yeah. There's another one. I mean, you, you've, you've put up a very interesting contrast between New Zealand, which Many of us would like to think we understand, and Vietnam, which I think most of us would say we have no idea about. Yeah. What do you see as some of the characteristics? How can we learn from that compare and contrast type approach? It's interesting. I'll go first. Yeah, so quickly, and then I'll let you in the same more. Uh, initially, I expected it to be very, very different. And in and but the only things that are really different are that we do have a lot of low-hanging fruit. They're not great at management, but then again, I look at some of the organisations around Welly and I don't think <laughs> necessarily that much more, but like you said, they're still having got a grasp on customer focus yet, yeah, let alone. Um, so, uh, yeah, so actually, maybe even that's not true. Uh, I think they are a little more naive about, about management and that. It's, it's maybe slightly worse. And the other thing is Confucianism. So absolute unquestioning respect of authority that is granted automatically by your age and your title. So that is deeply in the culture, right? That you just don't question a boss because they're a boss. Quite the opposite of ours, so disrespectful authority. That's probably the biggest difference to overcome. What, what would you say? Uh, uh, even in that case, not sure too. <laughs> <laughs> 
because you know what? They're not stupid. All the people who know who are in the system, they can make things work. They're not stupid. They know you whether you are pushing or you say the right. You you say the right thing and it works. It's, the thing is that the Vietnamese, I I my observation is that they are so willing to learn something new, some idea from Western. Uh, from Western country, from the, the ideas that can make their, make their lives better. And the way we start is all the way from the small step and proof, have a proof, proof point, they see the result and they want to get it more. And um, it's the fun fact that most of the, the people who I work with, the most successful people who I work with, they are women. You see the example, they're all women. Uh, some of them as well. Yes, yeah, some of them, some of them are men, but the, the percentage of women is at 95%. And the women who are in that position, they are very willing and they just like, you know, very determined. You don't get to be a CEO in a country that patriarchal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a yeah. woman without being a really awesome woman. Mm. So. So they they keep they listen and they try and yeah when they when they see the result you don't need to tell them you don't need to persuade them too much yeah so I think I don't know maybe because I have difficulty with men in Vietnam because they even though a lot of people get it they get it but they just don't win it <laughs> they just like okay it's a good idea. Yeah, you know, so, but they never actually take an action. They don't need to. They're in their position. They've got this automatic respect of authority. They've got themselves wedged in there. There's a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the, the thing is that they are uh, you know just they they don't listen to women. <laughs> yeah, they don't like taking advice <laughs> from a woman. They yeah. don't listen to a woman. They don't like it. And they so like Bing is an exception, the guy who's CEO of the logistics company. Mm. He listens, right? Yeah, yeah. He's quite a funky dude. You know, mm. he's he's not too entrenched in the traditional culture. But even but even though it's much it's much easier to talk to a woman and to persuade them to do something in Vietnam. It's almost all of my students. Is I would say ninety percent of all trainings are women. Only ten percent are men, and out of the ten percent, it's only like ten percent or twenty percent of men who actually do something. The men are deeply conservative. I mean, deeply, deeply conservative, and that's probably the biggest difference. Even my father and my brothers, who are big boss in Vietnam. They're one of the top companies in Vietnam who do the uh, fine art, um, traditional Vietnamese wooden furniture. So it's very big, but they know that people listen to me. Uh, even the VIP or you know the bank CEO of the bank, but they don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> my sister do. My sisters do listen to me, but not my brother and my father. So, so if anything, the different that's the only impediment I think over there. Mm. Otherwise, it's actually remarkably similar. Once you, people are people, once you get past the, the superficial cultural differences, people are people. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I have a question here from one of our consultants who is overseas and in the process of moving to New Zealand. Um, and he is saying thank you, and it's great to see him far more of work. Yeah. But he just wants to know, as someone who hasn't yet set foot in New Zealand, how receptive are clients here to your new ways of consulting? Oh, how receptive are people in New Zealand to these yeah. uh, Well, first of all, we don't know, because um, the advantage Sherry has in Vietnam that I don't have in New Zealand is that she has credibility, she has CD level access, whereas I'm my credibility is within the IT domain. So most of the work I do is IT management, not organizational management. So I, I would actually think people in this room would have a better sense for how receptive organizations are to these kinds of ideas. Yeah, in some ways, it's a deeply conservative 
country and in other ways we're an incredibly progressive country right which is true of vietnam as well i mean i went there with all these perceptions and was just blown away by this incredibly modern bustling high-tech nation um, with this unbelievably oppressive communist regime it's very the cognitive dissonance is extraordinary but um uh, yeah so so they are really progressive in some ways and deeply concerned like us as well. So, I don't know. I guess it's probably about the same. Maybe we should be targeting women in New Zealand as well. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you have questions here. Oh, thank you all very much for the thank opportunity to much. share these ideas. And yeah. I hope they were a little bit stimulated. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very, very much um, for coming along. It's great to hear something quite different um, uh, and, 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 and your perspectives. And thank you for sharing so much of your stories. It's great to hear them and, uh, and, and really appreciate um, you both coming along. And uh, great to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. How's that? You guys happy with that? Have a what? Have a group oh, picture. Oh, 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 yeah, just... <laughs> you think? Just stay there. I'll just get a lot of self. Really? When you when you're in Asia, you gotta take photos all the time. <laughs> you know that. It's fun to do. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay.